and Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior are happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Thank you, Ver, and thank you, audience, for being here. All right, I always want to read to you some of our emails before I speak. i got a few here that people have sent, and uh, these are people from around the world. We are on the internet, and we are live streaming every, every Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock Central Standard Time in America. And every Wednesday night at 6.30. These are people that write. We've got a new friend in Denmark, and her name is Sineda Polson. She's been writing us nearly every week, and uh, she writes us again, and she says, Hi, Mary and Pastor Jim. I pray that you both are in good health today. I've been sharing your messages and web page with my sister, who is a Muslim. She has been a Muslim for about 35 years now. In all gentleness, I, saw, I told her about the gospel of Christ, the hodos, the narrow way, and predestination. Finally, someone who did not get offended at me. And I also talked to a young friend, my sister's son, as they were trying to convert him to Islam. When I got Alone with him, I found out he came from Christian Orthodox family. Oh, that's something trying to convert him to Islam. Uh, and I asked him before he just turned away from the gospel of Jesus if he would take and listen to you. And he said, yes. I wrote your Grace and Truth ministry with Pastor Jim on his paper, and he took it. Pastor Jim, I love you from my heart, and you, Mary, Jim, you give me the courage to go on spreading the gospel. It has been hard. It is always hard. But I have never been happier knowing that this lost sheep, speaking of me, finally came home to the fold where I got solid food or manna. Thinking of Psalms 23, with hope and excitement, awaiting if I reach the elect of Christ here in Denmark through your messages, Pastor Jim. A big t hug to you and Mary, and sorry if it is difficult to understand I am tired this evening. I will keep in touch. I did tie to you this, I, did, I think she said tithe, did tithe to you this month, but did not write needy or anything, and I will keep on tithing if God wills, and and I live agape and phileo to all 
in Grace and Truth Ministry, Sineta Paulson in Denmark. That's a long way from here. And when you go overseas and you go to England and you fly on to Holland and fly on to Germany and you go up up the north, up there in the north, up there in the, those Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, you're up in the icy, cold countries. It's probably 5,000 miles from here or something like that. I need to go on my computer and find out how far it is. But anyway, we love you, Sonata. She's one of our new people. We love you, and this is a truth that not many are going to believe. It's just the way the truth is. Few will find the narrow way. Artifact Hunter commented on God is the potter, we are the clay. God separates light from darkness on the fourth day. Did you know that 20 most prominent Hebrew scholars say it's impossible to have a gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2? Well, I will differ with the 20 Hebrew scholars. There has to be time between 1 and 2 because... The Bible says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's verse 1. Created. Created is the word bara in the Hebrew. It means to cut and make fat. Fat to the Jew was not like the cellulite on our side. Fat to the Jew was the richest of cattle, the richest of crops, and then the Bible says the earth became without form, without form, and void and darkness, void and darkness. That's the very nature of Satan. There had to be a place where Satan was cast into the earth. He had to be cast in between verse 1 and verse 2 because when you find Michael the archangel, in the 12th chapter of Revelation, let me erase these songs over here. In the 12th chapter of Revelation, you find Michael the archangel casts out a third of the angels, a third of the angels into the earth. I don't care what these 12 great Hebrew scholars say. The thing is, uh, when he casts them out, if you want to find out where Satan, Satan and a third of the angels of heaven were cast out. If you want to find out where the where they were cast out into the earth, Satan was cast in the earth. A third of the angels were put in Tartarus. That's in the second chapter of Second Peter. It says hell, but it's the only place that that word Tartarus is used. It means the lowest pit of hell. That's where the angels are reserved unto judgment. Satan is in the earth, and he corrupts everything. He corrupts the earth. He corrupts, he corrupts the sun and the moon. The stars are not clean in his sight. And the Bible says we're not clean. And then, and, and this word without form is the word T-O-H-U-W. That's an unrighteous word. Void and darkness are unrighteous. That's the nature of Satan. And created is a righteous word. And God said in Isaiah 45 and 18, 45 and 18, he said, when I created the earth, I created nothing in vain. In vain is the word T-O-H-U-W. It's the same word as without form. God said, I didn't create that when I created the heavens and the earth in the first verse. There has to be time here. And when he created the heavens, the stars, notice this. When he creates the stars, every star is a sun. And, and light travels at 186,000 miles every second. It takes, it takes eight and a half minutes 
for light to get here from our sun, which is our star. It takes four and a half years for light to get here from Alpha Centaurus. That's the nearest star to us besides our own sun, Centaurus. Traveling at 186,000 miles per second takes four and a half years for light to get here from Alpha Centaurus. When you go out on a, when God created the heavens or the stars in the first verse, that light begins to speed towards the earth. Now, it would be very redundant for God to say, and darkness was up on the face of the deep. Darkness was up on the face. Face is the word panim, P-A-N-I-Y-M. Panim means surface. Why would God say darkness is upon the surface of the deep if light wasn't coming from foreign stars bouncing off whatever this this was around the earth. The best of scientists say there was a film around the earth of some kind at one time. The first chapter of Genesis is a picture of the elect because we're created in innocence then Satan comes into our life and corrupts us and then he's got six days of making and forming. Not six days of creation. The Bible doesn't say that. It says God would form this and that. It says he would separate the waters above the firmament from the waters under the firmament. He did all that was the works of a potter. Yatsar, Yatsar. Yatsar is a word potter. And that has basically the same meaning as when God would be forming all these waters and separating the earth. Those were days of making and forming. So just like you and I were created innocent, I believe God put predestination in the first chapter of Genesis. And then, he's, and then Satan is cast into the earth and then God picks up this corrupt dust and... And, and he forms Adam of the dust of the ground. And then he tells Adam, the forming is not the creation of Adam. He formed him and then he created him when he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then he looks at Adam and he's, Adam's made out of corruption. That's what happened between that first and second verse. Where did I get this? I got it from nowhere. I just kept looking at the Bible, looking at it, and, and separating. I, I got 186,000 miles per second from either my chemistry teacher or my physics teacher in high school. I remember that. So if, it, if, the, if the darkness is upon the surface of the deep, that means light is coming to be reflected. And he created the stars in the first, first verse. So therefore, it's bouncing off. And then God, when God says, let there be light, that's not when he created the light. He created the light here, didn't he? In the first verse. When he says, let there be light, he is saying, let the light in. What he's doing, he's circumcising the earth. He's circumcising the earth and saying, let it in. Everything in the first chapter of Genesis is a picture of our predestination. That's what it is. I don't have any doubt about that. I don't care who these Hebrew scholars are that is going to say there's no time between the first and second verses. What are you going to do with the speed of light? Huh? And they say that light has to travel 186,000 miles per second. If it travels any faster, it'll start slowing down. It'll, get, it'll gain some kind of brakes on it. I have got a book that's written about scientists, and it's got 
uh, uh, what's his name, the great famous scientist that studied light, and they can't tell you exactly how it works, but we know that it travels that fast. And that's why when God said, here's a tree in the garden, thou shalt not eat of the tree, but you are, he didn't say this part, but this is the fact. You're made of corrupt dust and you can't keep from eating. He said, he didn't say if you eat, he said the day you eat, you'll die. He said, you will eat. He had to eat because all of us that are believers, our names were written in the Bible, in the book of life before the foundation of the world, wasn't it? What, what, how, how was it written? Why was it written? Because God saved us out of our sin that Adam had to eat of the tree. He had to eat, didn't he? No, no doubt about it. It was in God's program. And it would, God creates sin that he, and he causes us, to, he allows us to go do it and programs us to do it. And then he gets angry at us when we do it. Now figure that out. <laughs> I can't figure it out. That's like he would call in Nebuchadnezzar to attack Israel. And then when Israel would be attacked, then several generations later, when Belshazzar was the king of Israel, he said, aha, I caught you, caught you taking my people into captivity. It wasn't Belshazzar, it was Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to get mad at Belshazzar. Well, he was a profligate. He was corrupt. You can't, you can't figure God out. Let me read the rest of this. The best scholars say there's no gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. I've never heard anybody say this. Have you? There has to be time there. And you know why I believe that? Because I don't believe God gave us a book that's too hard to understand. It's impossible to have a gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 because it's contextually impossible. You, uh, where is it contextually impossible? Young's translation, Young. I'm not going to go with Young or any other concordance. This is something I came up with myself. I had been told about the gap when I was young, but I had to do all this studying about it. Young's translation got this correct. In the day of God's preparing, our fossil record is filled with evidence of humans. <laughs> if there were if there were if there were man-like beings upon the earth in the first creation, God said he created the first creation there in Isaiah 45, 18 to be inhabited. That would be the original creation. We don't know what happened. We don't know what that was like in the original creation. God said it was to be inhabited. I have personally found fossilized fabric from the bottom of this fossil record. I have... I'm sure you're an authority on this artifact, Hunter. I have personally found concretions that contain thorns and thistles. If our Bible is correct, then this fossil record come from Noah's flood. Boy, you sound like some brilliant authority. The best book on this subject is called Unformed and Unfilled by Western Fields. What are you going to do with all this? What are you going to do with the speed of light? We've got, you can go out on a clear night. Some of the stars you see, they're not even there anymore. They're burnt out and the light's coming this way. And they may be 22 million light years away from us. I've got a, I've got a, uh, uh, a DVD that is uh, the edge of the universe is what it's called. If you watch this, scare the life out of you. <laughs> it is unbelievable. At the end of it, after the guy that's narrating it is that, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, he's a movie star. He's got a smooth voice. The guy that shot the woman on the set of the movie. Oh, Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. He's the one that's narrating it. It sounds pretty cool the way he's narrating it. And he talks about our universe, 
our sun, uh, our moon, Venus, Uranus, uh, Jupiter, and so forth. And he goes through that, and then he says, let's go out to the edge of our universe, and he talks about Pluto. And Pluto is not a dog, it's a star way out there on the edges of our universe. And then he says, after he says this, it's ice, I believe. Then he says, let's go out here further than this. And he'll say, let's go out to, let's go out to this, uh, no, he'll say something like uh, this death star. And this is where some star implodes. This is a star's like a big sun, and it implodes, and one teaspoonful of it would weigh a hundred million tons. It's so condensed. And then he'll say, let's go further than this. And he'll say, let's go out 25 million light years away from this, and we'll get out here to a quasar, or he'll say to a imploding star or to an exploding star. And, uh, and it just brightens up the universe. And then the very end of it, he says, let's go further out. He may say 25 million light years. Let's go to this quasar out here. That's a frightening thing. To think God could create all of this. I wonder what this guy's got to say about this. And he says, a quasar, this sucks in millions of planets into the center of it and shoots a flame a trillion miles out in space. You go, whoa. It'll scare you bad to see it. It's like a horror movie. You think, this is our God? How can you explain Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 if you can't explain that? I don't believe you can. But if you want a copy of that, we'll make some copies and give them to everybody. I think we, Mike, do we have any copies? Yeah. We got some copies. It's kind of frightening to watch it because you realize how nothing we are. Nothing. That's Artifact Hunter. Enough said about him. Truth Seeker. Righteous about predestination, lexical intrusion, def definition, and grammatical force. I preached a message on the grammatical force of words. Thank God for real truth. This is so full of fire, the Word of God. Thank you, Pastor Jim Brown, for explaining and making plain the truth seekers to understand. This is truly the shepherd att attending to his flock. Thank you for the feeding. I really love everything taught in this video lesson from beginning to end, truly educational. That's something. Thank you so much, Truth Seeker. Keep writing to us. Old Ram Truck writes, um, and about, writes to us about 70 weeks of Daniel, everything that is brought about in biblical history. It's one story. We're free to do whatever we want as long as we don't sin. I don't understand that. I mean, where'd you get that? You can't do what you want. If you sin, you won't get beat up. A lot of people are going to be shocked when they die. First John 3, 8 through 10, he that committed sin is of the devil. <laughs> you haven't heard me teach on the inner and the outer man, have you? There's an inner and the outer man. You'll find this in Romans 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 4th chapter. You'll find it in Ephesians, the 4th chapter. Colossians, the 3rd chapter, has got tons about the inner and outer man. It'll say, put on the outer man, put on the inner man. Put on in duo means to sink into clothing of the... you got an inner and an outer man. The outer man cannot... Sin, or the outer man sins and cannot quit sinning. The inner man can't sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. That's the new birth. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You need to read those verses. Read all about the inner and the outer man. This is, uh, then he says, we're free to do whatever we want. First John 
3, 8 through 10, he that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning, for this is the purpose of the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, that's the, that's the inner man. For his seed remaineth in him and cannot sin, because he's born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth righteousness is not of God, and he that loveth not his brother. Loveth is the word agapao. If you don't walk in God's commandments in front of your brother, it's sin. Then Ed K. writes to us, commented on predestination, the names written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. All lies, no such thing. Well, let me say it the way I think. All lies, no such thing as that, Brian. <laughs> it sounds ignorant, doesn't it? I was a believer for 40 years. I know your tricks used to beat humans down for the for the God delusional mind controls you men you men use on us. You got that? <laughs> That's the only way I can read something like that. He has to be a redneck. He's a redneck in the word, that's for sure. You know what a redneck is? That's a man that lives in Alabama and he goes out, plows all day long, and he plows on the back of his neck, gets sunburned, and all he knows is plowing. And he comes up one day, nothing wrong with being a farmer, but he comes up one day and falls on the ground, and there's a Bible there. says, God must want me to preach. <laughs> I guess. Song Fister Lou commented on 1,000 years, 70 weeks of Daniel, the 70th week. Two witnesses put to death three and a half days. Hi, Jim, towards the end of this teaching, you stress that the KJ made a mistake by referring to the beast as a him. That's exactly true. Opposed to an it. Then you proceeded to refer to the beast as just that, an it. That's what he is. He was an it in the Old Testament. It was Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome in the Old Testament. It's still an it in the New Testament. Besides that, that's exactly what it says in an interlinear Bible. It says it in this. It's got the Greek on the top line, the English right under it. All right. Just wanted to make sure that in Revelation 13 and 4, where you said it is going to take over the world, he is going to be so charming. Well, there's going to be a man of sin that's going to be charming. The man of sin is not the beast. The man of sin is the ruler of the beast. It will be a man. Isn't a contradiction? No. you got to know that the beast is a system. There will be a man that's ahead of the system. He's called the man of sin. Some people want to call him the Antichrist. Antichrist is only mentioned in First and Second John. Or do you intend to say that? I said what I just told you. I thought that it's very important to clarify because to me at least this is difficult to decipher. It's not. If the dragon is the beast and the beast is the dragon, are they both the same or not? Yes, they are the same. If you read the 12th chapter of Revelation, the first few verses, and read the 13th chapter, the dragon has seven heads and ten horns, and the beast has seven heads and ten horns, and I'm not going to go into the heads right now. That's a capital city of an empire. Enough said. It is my opinion, after listening to you, that the beast... Are these empires now in history? They are. That's exactly right. And the dragon is artificial intelligence. It's not, a, it's not AI. It's a man that's going to be heading it up. He's called, he has several titles. I won't go into them right now. He's, he's got so many titles, but he's going to head the system, which commonly known currently as AI. Artificial intelligence is not the man of sin. It may play a part in this whole system. Not sure if you considered that. No, I have not considered artificial intelligence being the man of sin. He's called the king of fierce countenance. 
He's a man that's going to be very intelligent. The king of fierce countenance, when you look at that in the eighth chapter of Daniel, he's the head of the world system. If this is true or not, but the latest technology, God's going to make our technology. The, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, Paul said. But the latest technology they have now is the chemical mixed with fiberglass that when damaged has the capability to heal itself. Okay. Okay. You think God can do that? You think God can do more than that? Another thing is they supposedly have capability to preserve somebody's mind. Well, they can't make a man born again, that's for sure, and transplant it into a new body. They're claiming, you keep talking about they. Who are you talking about they? They're claiming. You're just, I don't believe everything I read, do you? I'll tell you something. Sometimes I'll say, I don't know if this is true or not, but it sounds good. They're claiming that they can grow bodies from DNA. So what? God can, God can make a body out of nothing. He can make a body out of nothing and breathe life into it. Another thing is AI has the capability to control your thoughts of someone on the other side of the computer. I don't know if I believe that or not because they can control my thoughts. Not when I am in Christ. Am I mistaken when I associate the dragon with the serpent as the same thing? Well, I can discuss the serpent, Nakash, who enchants the dragon that fascinates you're, you're getting into questions that I'll have to sit here for an hour and a half to even talk about. Write us again, Songfister, if you want to. Dylan Dickey writes to us, comments on why the 70 weeks of Daniel, why it is measured out in 360-day Jewish years. Is the Lord's Prayer a sinner's prayer? <laughs> no. The Lord's Prayer... The apostles came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gives them the Lord's Prayer and they're believers. It's not a sinner's prayer. It's a believer's prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not talking about literal bread. He said, if you seek me and my commandments, food will be added unto you. Dylan, write us again. Leonardo Maste in, over in Philippines. Comment. When does the 70 weeks of Daniel take place? If I knew that, I could tell everybody and everybody go home and be prepared when it was going to happen. At the end of time is exactly right. We are headed towards it. Predestination is my favorite subject. That's our topic next week of our preacher's training. He's having a preacher's conference. I don't know how you can get together a whole bunch of preachers that believe in predestination I can't that'll be enough reading I'll uh, I'll give you some announcements and I got a book over here I want to read some things to you Mary has got a new book and it's uh, she goes online and gets all of these statements and get these many biographies of these guys and uh, this is her volume four book we don't sell these to make money you can have one at the cost to print it $22 what it costs to print one of these and it's got all of these uh, ancient preachers some of the recent preachers like A.W. Pink he died in 1952 he wrote like a like a puritan writer it's got martin luther in here it's got miniature biographies of luther uh it's got uh, augustus top lady who wrote rock of ages all these people believe in predestination it's got charles spurgeon 
and uh, I've read I've read some from all those people. What I'd like to do is got a little biography of of uh, Newton, of John Newton, the man that wrote Amazing Grace. Let me read you some of his biography. I read to you his early life. John Newton was a sailor, and he was uh, he was. Uh, his family, his mother was a Christian, but she died when he was young, and his father was a captain in in, uh, in the uh, British uh, on a British ship, and uh, and his father was trying to be strict with him, and get him to behave himself, and he got him on a ship in uh, in the British Navy, and he wasn't real happy with it. Let me read this. Many dangerous toils and snares. Deciding to discipline this unsettled and impulsive son, Newton's father sent the young man back to sea to work as a common sailor. At 19, Newton was forced to enlist in the British Royal Navy and served as a crewman aboard the man of war ship Harwich. Newton rebelled against the severe discipline of the Royal Navy. He became desperate to find a way back to his beloved Mary, and soon Newton ended up taking a job with a slave trader, a man named Mr. Clow. On the, on the island of the western coast of Africa near Sierra Leone, he was treated to so brutally that there that later he would remember the time on the lowest point in the spiritual experience. He recalled himself then as a wretched looking man toiling in the plantation of lemon trees in the island of plantains. He had no shelter, his clothes deteriorated to rags and to and to curb his hunger he resorted to begging for food the hour I first believed I'll read that paragraph and then I'll read another next week after more than a year of living in abusive conditions in 1747 Newton managed to escape the island he took work aboard the, the Greyhound a, a, a ship based out of Liverpool, but this time Newton had begun to read the Bible again as well as Thomas A. Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, one of the few books on board the ship. The following year, as the slave-laden ship was bound for Horn, it encountered a violent North Atlantic storm on March 21st, 1748, Newton was awakened in the night to find the ship in dire trouble and one sailor already washed overboard as Newton pumped and bailed. He became convinced that he would soon meet the Lord, recalling Bible verses about God's grace. However, he would take several months before Newton's newfound faith would become firmly established in his autobiography and authentic narrative, 1764. Newton wrote an episode of a series backsliding only after falling ill with violent fever did he return to his senses and surrender wholly to God. I saw a special on him and said he, he just got mean when he was out there on those pirate ships, meaner than a snake. He said even the other pirates that are on the slave ships, they hated him. He claimed that from then on he would experience new kind and spiritual freedom. And that's all I'll read on him. I got a miniature biography of Jonathan Edwards. And got all these sayings by Thomas Watson, probably my favorite writer. And I've got a cup, I've got a few others. This is really one of the best books she came up with. J.C. Ryle, she's even got her in the back of this book. She said she likes J.C. Ryle. That's her favorite person. 
with his sayings. I'll read a couple of things by J.C. Raw. He that is not zealous against error is not likely to be zealous for truth. Uh, if you dislike a holy God now, why would you want to be with him forever? If worship does not capture your attention at present, what makes you think it will thrill you in the heavenly future? If ungodliness is in your delight here on earth, what will please you in heaven where all is clean and pure? He's got a couple of them here I really like. Let me see if I can find another one. Nothing whatsoever, whether great or small, can happen to a believer without God's ordering and permission. There is no such thing as chance, luck, or accident in the Christian's journey through this world. All is arranged and appointed by God, and all things are working together for the believer's good. J.C. Ryle. That'll be all I'll read this week. All right. I've got... Uh, I've got a few announcements. We're on TV in Nashville Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night at 8.30 on channel 49. That's Comcast TV. We, you may call it Xfinity. It's Xfinity or Comcast, and we're on TV. Uh, we're on TV in a bunch of stations across America. It's public access TV, and then we are... Uh, we're on the internet throughout the world. That's where most of our offerings come from. If you like this message and you really, a lot of people were watching us regular and I would think if you really like the message, you will want to give to the ministry and help get this message out. We, we've got an overhead. We don't look like it with few people here. But we've got an overhead of about $46,000 we have to come up with every month. And that is to pay, it's about $5,000 just for Nashville TV for what we're on there. And uh, then we've got the lights here and we've got the rent for this suite. And the rent is about $1,600 every month. And we, Mike is, we've got a, five full-time workers. That's several thousand dollars there. And uh, we've got, uh, I don't even know all the expense we have. I just write the checks when Mike says we need a check for this or that. And uh, that's, and I write them. I, I really would like for, if you really like this message, support us. Because we've been going for 35 years, going on 36 years. We started as a Bible class in my house, and we've been on public access TV. We've been on the Internet, and people see us all over the world. And we're just trying to get the message of predestination, uh, God doesn't love everybody. Christmas is pagan. Easter's pagan and all of that. We just want people to hear these things. We've got people we give money to. You have to be in, have a disease that's debilitating. We've got a lady that we send $300 a month to down in Australia. A lady in Amarillo, Texas, we send 300 a month to. We've got a lady in and Murfreesboro, Tennessee, we send 300 a month too. That's $900 to three people, $900 to them. We've got several we send 100 to, several we send $50 to. They're not fighting a disease, but they're real poor, and they're really struggling with things. And we'd like for you to support us if you would. We don't ever ask for money. I ask for the needy. If you want to give to these needy people, Make your check to Grace and Truth Ministries and put on the bottom of the check X amount of dollars for the ministry and X amount of dollars for 
the needy. And we'll make sure they get that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. We pray that you'll fight our battles for us. We've got people that want to destroy this ministry and stop it right in the middle of what we're doing. And, Lord, that's your business to fight them. It's not mine. I will not fight anyone. Not ever again. I'm tired of that. The servant of God, you said, does not fight. It's not macho. He doesn't go out here and, and fight verbally or any other way. Those people that fight, Lord, convict their hearts to stop this. And we'll praise you for everything. Fight our battles for us in Christ's name. Amen. Give me a drink of water. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm teaching to you something that people don't have any idea what it's about. Most of the world hates the doctrine of predestination. Predestination is a fact. It's in the Bible. You bunch of people out there, Baptists particularly, and Pentecostals and and uh, the others out there, the, the other denominations, Church of Christ, that hate this doctrine. I've, I've had people, I've had, I've said, do you believe in predestination? I hate predestination. You can't hate it. It's Bible. You call yourself a Christian, you go to church. The Bible says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed, predestinate. We are there's certain verses here. There's certain words you need to pay attention to. Predestinate. 
These are the whom's that God foreknew. Whom? This does not say what God foreknew. He predestinated. It's the whom's, the people he foreknew. What is O-U-S with a dear critical mark? Who's? That's masculine gender, <coughs> plural. That's all of the people, all of the men and women in the world that God knew whom he did foreknow. Foreknow is the word prognosco, P-R-O-G-I-N-O-S-K-O. Prognosco. We get our word prognosis from that, or a doctor gets his word prognosis. But a doctor, I said it last time I taught, a doctor doesn't do a prognosis because this word prognosco comes from gnosco, G-I-N, or gnosis, which means no or knowledge. That's something you learn. And doctors don't have a knowledge of, of disease. They go to school and they try to learn what a disease is about, and they treat you. They give you a pill or a shot and say, if that don't work, come back next week and we'll give you another shot or another pill. Well, pro is our prefix pre. So the people God foreknew, he did not foreknow everybody in the world. He said there in Matthew 7th chapter, he's going to say to those on his left hand, depart from me, I never gnosko you. I, didn't, I never knew you. They're not included in the whom. Well, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now, the word is not predestinate in the Greek. The word is prognosco. Pre, uh, excuse me. Not prognosco. It's prohorizo. Pro horizo. There are no H's in the Greek language, but there is an H sound. It's a breathing sound. It has a breath sound like horizo. No, no H in the Greek, but every time you have a diacritical mark, and when you look the word horizo up in a concordance, it will have, they write the H in knowing that you're not going to be able to see possibly that diacritical mark. So they go ahead and put the H in there for us because there's no H's. There's H's in the, in the English alphabet, but not in the Greek. There's just the diacritical mark. Well, horizo is a very peculiar word. It means to predetermine the horizo. When you go online, I've told you to go online, and look up the ancient origins of the word horizon. Look up the word, just ancient origins. Don't just look up the origin of horizon. They'll give you something out of Webster's Dictionary. Look up ancient, ancient origins. On the, go on the Internet. You're not going to believe how much you're going to find. It's all over the Internet. And this is just some of the pages. I couldn't print all of them out because they had one one right after another. There's, I got four or five pages, and I could have printed out. You know how you go, and there'll be a, there'll be one writer saying here's, here's his understanding, the other in here. Well, one of the writers said, Horizo was the. I've told you this already. That predestinate is a verb. Predestinate is a verb. And one of the writers tells you that horizo is the verb form. Verb form of horizon. It's the verb. Horizo is the verb. A verb shows you've got being verbs and you've got action verbs. Action verbs like jump run, 
throw uh, pass if passing a football. Uh, just any number of words that shows action. That's an action verb. That's what horizo is. It is an action verb. It shows movement. It shows movement of what we are predestined to. I already said this to you once, but I'm going to say it again so you'll understand. When you have an action verb, I learned this. I don't know. Elementary school. We didn't have middle school when I was in school in the 40s. We had, we had elementary, junior high, and high. Elementary was one through six, grade one through six. Junior high was seventh, eighth, ninth. And high school was, was 10, 11, 12. But when I was somewhere and I was just a kid, I don't know where, sixth grade, maybe fifth, I learned what action verbs were. I don't think they teach that anymore, do they? You got being verbs. Be, is, am, are, was, were, being, been, have, has, had, do, does, did, shall, will, should, would, may, might, cuss, must, can, could. One of my elementary school teachers said, memorize these being verbs. A being verb is a helping verb. Help. Helping. It sometimes it will help. He is he is throwing the ball. That's a helping verb, it's helping throwing. Or he has thrown the ball. Thrown would be a action verb. You need to know what these things are because you're gonna run across in the Greek. Well, every time you have an action verb you must have a direct object. Direct object, when you look at this, let me just go ahead and tell this to you, because people, I don't know if people know this. Right here. When you have, this is all of the different words for the in the Greek. You have masculine, and then singular, you got masculine, feminine, neuter, gender. In the plural, you got masculine, feminine, neuter, gender. And you got the cases. That's where it is in the sentence and what it does. You have the nominative case, that's the subject, or the predicate nominative. I learned what predicate nominatives were in about the seventh grade. Jim is the pastor. Pastor in the predicate, that's the last half of the sentence. All the end of the sentence is the predicate. This is the predicate nominative. A predicate nominative equals what's in the subject. Jim and pastor are the same thing. That's like when you learn, I believe if you can learn what a predicate nominative is, there's always a being verb involved in it. And then over here, the nominative case is the subject or the predicate nominative. The genitive case shows possession. Baptism of repentance. Baptism of repentance. If you look up of repentance, it will tell you that it is genitive case. That means true baptism belongs to repentance that means it can't be water if you even know that much right there you can show that to somebody and say it's not water because true baptism you're you can't be dipped in water and be repenting then you go on down here to the dative case that's the indirect object there's one two three four five six ways to spell the indirect object. If I said, Jim threw the ball to John. Or he could say, Jim threw John the ball. In both cases, John is the indirect object. Ball is the direct object. Well, when you get down here, 
you get down to what I'm talking about on this on this direct on this the the direct object receives the action. The accusative voice is that's the direct object all the way across here. So it depends in the Greek on how you spell it. So when you're talking about prohorizo is a verb. It's an action verb. It has to have, it has to, it must. It must have a direct object. Well, the direct object is to be conformed. That doesn't look like a noun, but it is. It is a noun. To be conformed is an infinitive. It's called a verbal noun. It's a verbal noun. Even Mr. Strong will tell you that in the McClinic and Strong, when you look up baptize, he'll say baptize was and was a verbal noun. Now I know what I know it's an infinitive, so I'll just tell you it's an infinitive. It's a noun. The main thing to be conformed is a noun, but it's verbal in character. It's just like I've said about baptize being a verbal noun. That's where You've got a man, and from an outer source, you've got, from an outer source, you've got a fluid that comes because that's, this is being a verbal noun, baptized, baptizo. You've got the fluid coming and standing and dying the person that cannot possibly be water. The fact that baptizo is a verbal noun. It's an infinitive. It can't be dipping people in water. That's insane. I don't know why I can find that. Because you can read Mr. Strong or read Mr. Girdlestone and they'll tell you. There's a lot of mistakes because men have misinterpreted the Bible. I'm going to teach on Easter this uh, coming Sunday. But Easter, that when you look up Easter, it's one time in the Bible. I'm just going to show you this mistake as long as we're at, long as we're at it. And it's in the, there's one time Easter's in the Bible. Let's look at it here. In Acts, it's a bad translation. Bad. <laughs> I don't... And I don't apologize for that. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. How do you know? I go to the experts. I go to Strong's. I go to, you can look it up in, in, in uh, the Interlinear Bible. You can look it, look it up in, uh, in the Word Study Concordance. And it's wrong. Look here. I'll just say this and I'll get back to predestination. But I'm going to say this again probably Sunday. Acts, the 12th chapter. 12th chapter. It's talking about Peter being taken in verse 1. Now about, the, about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews... He proceeded further to take Peter. Also, he took Peter and captive to the to the king Herod. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is where the Passover begins, isn't it? And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep Peter intending after Easter. What a stupid translation they did there. Idiocy. When you look up Easter and you look up, it will tell you this is the word, Pascha. <laughs> the 
The Paschal lamb is the Passover lamb. And besides that, it just got through saying these were the days of men living bread, the time of the Passover. This is wrong. Period. And I dare any professor in America tell me that it's not. When you look it up and you take and you take the number and you go to the Word Study Concordance, you look it up in the Word Study Concordance. It'll show you how many times Pascha. You look at one verse, it says Pascha. Another verse says Pascha. And you look at another verse, Pascha. Another verse, Pascha. Another verse, Pascha. Then you get to this verse and it says Easter. Easter is not Passover. It's just wrong. You can do with it what you want. I'm not going to. And I will correct it. I, there's other places I don't know what these guys are thinking when they put Easter in there. Easter, Easter was a goddess of the morning come from Ashtar, and we get Ashtaroth from that, and those are the female deities that Israel worshipped. Oh, Lord help us. Now, I'm talking about there has to be a direct object for this for this work for this to be conformed is sumorphos S U M M O R P H O S P H O S. That is one word in the Greek and it's a noun with verbal character, it's an infinitive. The action of predestinate God has got to conform us to the image, E-I-K-O-N, to the likeness of Christ. Likeness of Christ. And people don't like that. Sum means, sum is a, it sometimes is used as a synonym for meta. Meta is not quite the same as sum, because sum means to blend together. And God has picked out a people that he's predestined, predestined, prohorizo, which is a verb, to be conformed to the image, to the likeness of Christ. It comes from sum, sum and morphe, more M-O-R-P-H-E, which means to be shaped, Together, when we walk together, we're, that's why we have to have fellowship one with another because fellowship. And I want to point out something to you. That this word horizo is the same thing as light. The horizon is where the light shines. So when you see light, and what else is light? The truth is the light. The truth. What else is light? Jesus is the light of the world. And didn't John say if we walk in the light as he is in the light, if we walk in truth as he is in truth, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So anywhere you find light, it's talking about the same thing as horizo, which is the verb form of the horizon. The horizon is where the light shines. I keep saying this, and I'm going to say it more and more, that the word prison means the division of day and night, or let's say the horizon and night, and light and darkness. That's the word prison. And Bible says God is going to release the spirits in prison. And the spirits in prison, the ones that were in darkness were the Gentiles for 4,000 years from Adam until Acts 2 when God poured out of his spirit on all flesh. That's what that's talking about. Now, I got a paper here. I just want to show you something. Most people think 
we have been predestined to walk in the light upon this earth. But most people think that prison is some... They think that Jesus went down to hell. Jesus didn't go to hell. Jesus wouldn't... He paid for our sins on the cross. This has to do with the spirits in prison. Let me turn you back over there to First, first Peter. I'll tell you what people believe about this. First Peter 3, and I've read this before. I'm going to read it again. For Christ, verse 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He was just, we were unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit. When you talk about put to death, and quickened. One word meets the criteria of these two words. One word. To come to life after, to come to life quickened, Z-O-O P-O-I-E-O -O -E to come to life zoom po o means to quicken to make alive to come alive after dying is the word resurrection. You have to look at synonyms for words when you're studying the Bible. Resurrection or the gospel, that is the resurrection. The gospel, so the gospel is the resurrection, is being put to death and quickened by the Spirit. It is quickened. They all have the same meaning. So when you get back, so when he says, this being put to death and quickened, that is resurrection or the gospel. You can actually take being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit. Instead of having those two phrases, you can hate, say, by the gospel, by the resurrection, and then go into the next verse, by which. The gospel is by which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The gospel was given. The gospel is coming to the light. And the people that were in prison in darkness for 4,000 years was the Gentiles. The Gentiles were not given the truth all through the Old Testament. Gentile is the word goyim, G-O-Y-I-M in the Hebrew. It's the word ethnos in the Greek, ethnos. And God went and preached to the Gentiles in prison, and he's still preaching to them. The movement of this verb here is continual. So he's preaching to the spirits that were in prison. If God, if, if Israel had not gone after Baal in the grove and Shemash and Molech and Venus and Osiris and all these gods of Egypt and all the people around them, if they hadn't have gone after that, God wouldn't have scattered Israel and then turned to us and given us the gospel of light. He's given us the truth. He has enlightened the believer. I've got a paper here. It's got all of the words. It comes out of it comes out of the word study concordance. It's got every time the word light is mentioned. Light is the word phos. <clears throat> to study the light is to study the horizon. To study the light is to study horizo. The light, horizo is the movement in our lives that God requires by scourge, by trial, by daily cross, dead to self, self denial. He puts us through all kinds. He scourges every son he believes so we can be a partaker of his holiness. Holiness, that's an interesting word. Hagiosmos. Watch how these words come together. H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S. -S. Hagiosmos is the word holiness. And holiness comes from the word holy. Holy means to be single or pure. Now this has to do with being conformed to the image of Christ. Being conformed to his image, to his likeness. But that's here upon the earth. Predestination is about the boundary here on earth. In fact, one of the, one of the definitions here in Horizon, 
out of the off the internet is border coast border we have to walk in the border of god in his coast and every nearly every one of these writers will say the word horizo means border it means the coastline where we have to walk. We have to walk inside the truth. And we're not willing because we've got that outer man that wants to sin, that self. Paul said, with the outer man I serve the law of the flesh. And the inner man serves the law of God. The inner man can't sin. This outer man can't quit sinning. So God sends us trials and persecution. That's what this being conformed is. We're being conformed in this world. That's, but people who don't believe that believe that, well, once I get saved, I'm home free and I don't have to change anymore. And I'm grown up. You don't grow up when you're born. You're not grown as a baby. You can be 70 years old and not, and not be grown in this truth. We used to have a guy named Big Al come here. And Big Al... He was about 75. I was about 55 at the time. He's passed away now. But he walked up to me after church one day, and he said, Brother Jim, I'm just a baby in this. I was raised Catholic, and I don't know much about it, but I really believe what you're saying is true. I know he went to be with the Lord, but he, he said he was a baby. But just because you're 55 or 60 years old don't mean you're not a baby in the Word takes a long time to become mature in the word. Hagiosmos comes from holy. It means singular, pure. What makes you pure is fire. When you take gold and put it in the fire, gold ore, and you turn the heat up, it'll start burning out the lesser metals. It'll burn out copper and zinc and turn it higher and higher and higher. Get it hot, so hot that you and I couldn't stand it. It'll burn out all of the out of the other materials except gold. And they, if they keep burning, gold will never scorch, and the gold will become pure and be liquid like water. And it'll be able to conform to any shape. And that's what God does to us. The tribe of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. And there's a word between two of these. It's the word hagiazo, H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. Hagiazo means to separate or to make holy. To make holy, that's exactly what being conformed to Christ's image is. That's here in this life. As long as we live, we're going to keep going through fire and trials. That's not going to go away. That's why Peter said, uh, or Paul said, thinking not strange concerning the fire. Peter said, it, he said, thinking not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. That's not strange. Kazenos, X or X E N O S. It comes from Knizzo, X-E-N-I-Z-O, which is stranger. It's not an occasional guest. Welcome to the world of Christianity. This is something that preachers don't preach to people, that you have to go through the fire. That's the only thing that will conform you to his likeness, to his image. That has to be. But there's another word that means to... Purify and sanctify, another word. And when I put it on the board, it's very amazing because you got the word horizo. Pro horizo is predestinate. The other word is op horizo. Op horizo. Op horizo comes from oppo, meaning to set off. And horizo is the same word here. And aporizo means to separate or sanctify. You're not sanctified. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to be sanctified. You're being sanctified here 
Sanctified don't mean to be standing up there looking real holy and real self-righteous. Sanctify is by the fire. God's, let me give you a couple of those words. When, when the Bible says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. There in Luke 6, 22. When they, when they hate you, when they reproach you, when they separate from your company, that word separate is the word aporenzo. It's akin to face. God's going to set off the boundary line of the horenzo for us. He sets it off in our life. And we have to walk in this light as he is in this light. Every time you find light and it has to do with Christ, it's talking about this. He's talking about walking in the light. People say that I hate predestination. You know what that's like? It's like being a five-year-old in some class and God is saying, and they're saying, well, I just don't like it being being sanctified and I don't want to grow up. And I just don't want to stay five the rest of my life. You can't. God's not going to let you stay a baby. He's not going to let you do that. And you've got all these, you've got this word, Renzo. This is, comes out of the, out of the book, the, uh, I, sometimes I just go blank on things. Out of this book here, out of the Word Study Concordance, I'll leave it up here. This is, ten times this word "aporenzo" is used in the New Testament. It has it right at the top of the, right here, right "aporenzo." I, I highlighted in yellow, and it means to set off a boundary or limit for us to walk in. That is, aporizo is what is the boundary that God has horizoed us for. And he's done it before the foundation of the world. Pro means before. You, you know what you've got to do? You've got to throw away all your, all your uh, English and all of your pronunciations and all of your definitions to not believe in predestination. You got to throw away all of your ability to evaluate things. When Paul says in Acts 13 and 2, and the scripture says, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work of the Lord, that word separate, aporenzo, but they're being separated to go on their first missionary journey so they can be like Christ, be like him. And then you've got down here where, where look at Romans 1 and 1. Romans 1 and verse 1. I like this. Romans 1 and verse 1. This is aporizo. Aporizo and proporizo are kin. They belong to one another. Apo means to set off or to separate God is separating a boundary line for us to walk in so we can be like Christ. And all the trials that you go through, I've been through so many trials in my life, it's a wonder I'm not dead. Should have been. I've been real close to death eight or ten times. I'm really just sitting right on it. And when he says here in Romans 1, Acts Romans, let me get over here. I like this. Romans 1 and verse 1. 1 and verse 1. 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated, aporizo, separated for what? For the horizo, for the light. Light is truth. The truth, here's the horizon of God. It's the word of God. It's when we act and we live in it. And then he says, let me read some more of this. Which he had promised afore by his prophets and holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ, 
our Lord, now keep reading with me, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared, Horizo, declared as Horizo, and it is, it is a participle. A participle is a verbal adjective. What does an adjective do? It, it, an adjective tells which, what kind of, how many. This tells which son. This would be like which, what kind of, or how many. This tells which son. He is the Horizon Son, the declared Son of God. He's the declared Horizon Son of God. So you've got Horizon in this first chapter, and you've also got Op Horizon in this first first four verses of this chapter here. And then he'll tell you uh, in Second Corinthians. 6. Look at 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Here's the word aporizzo. I hope you can see aporizzo is God setting off the boundary that we have to walk in the light in or walk in the horizzo in. And the horizzo is the horizon. And uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Maybe you've beat me there and you already got it down. And this word separates 6 and 17. I love this 6th chapter. 6 and 17. Wherefore, because... You cannot mix with the world, come out. He's saying, he's talking about before this, about uh, be not the unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? What communion hath light? You're the light. You're the horizo. Anytime you see horizo, it equates, it's, an, it's a synonym for light. It's the sunshine. It's where the sun shines. What fellowship does light or the sun or horizo have with darkness? Remember light and darkness is, is the definition of prison. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what fellowship hath he and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of God. There was a temple in the Old Testament. Now we're the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, because you're not supposed to be fellowshipping with the world, you're supposed to be like Jesus in his likeness, because of that, come out from among them and be ye aporizzo, separate. That word separate is aporizzo. It's a direct connection. It's like God has set off this aporizzo. To set off means apo. He set off this horizzo for us. And he has prohorizoed us from the foundation of the world. He's preordained those of us that he's chosen to be inside this horizon, and he set off this horizon for us by trials and persecution and, and daily cross and tribulation. And all these things we have to go through that causes us to walk inside his horizon, inside his horizon. And there's several others. He said in, in Galatians 1.16, look at Galatians. 
Galatians 1.16. Trying to turn the pages in this old Bible, and they won't hardly turn. Falling apart on me. All right. Galatians 1.15. 15. Fifteen, but when it pleased God to separate me, aporizo is the word separate. He separated me for the horizo because he's predestined me pro horizo before the world began. And when he sep- it pleased God from to separate me from my mother's womb and call me by his grace to reveal his son in me, but I had to go out and kill a bunch of Christians first. And he revealed his son when he struck me down on the Damascus Road in Acts 9 chapter. So he separated me, called me by his grace to reveal his son in me after I had killed hundreds of Christians and made havoc of the church that I might preach among the heathen, that I might preach the Gentiles to the Gentiles, that I may preach. Can you see the connection between apo rizzo and proho rizzo? Apo means to set off. God's going to set this off. But he did it before the world began. And horizon is the horizon or the light. For somebody not to believe predestination, they're saying, I don't believe in light. I don't believe in truth. I don't believe in Jesus because they're all the same thing. Things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. That's a good algebra axiom. Look at, but it's not always in a good way. He says in Galatians 2.12, when, when he, Paul came to Galatia, And Peter was there, and he sees Peter being hypocritical. And Peter sees Paul coming with a bunch of Jews, and he separates himself from these Gentiles that he'd been fellowshipping with. And Paul gives him a hard time about it in Galatians 2.12. For before that certain came from James, Peter ate with the Gentiles, And when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, separated Apolizo. See, that's something you can do and I can do, but it has to do with God. He separates us. He separated himself, leaving them which were of the circumcision. Now, I've got all these things about horizon. Got them off the Internet. I just simply went on and searched for uh, the ancient Greek word horizon. First thing they say, it means boundary. It's the boundary. And going down here, one etymology, in Middle English, horizon, from the late horizon, horizon T, horizon from the Greek, Horizon from the present participle horizon to bound, define from horus, boundary. Remember I told you it was the boundary? And when it translated in the Old Testament, the word boundary in the in the when they translated it in the lexicon LXX, these translated translators translated Boundary horos, O-R-O-S, which is the boundary of the horizon. What you would call this boundary right here, that was called the horos of the horizo. Horizo was where the light shines, and the boundary of it is this circle here. And then let me go on and read some of these other definitions. I saw this years ago that Horizo was boundary. It was a boundary of of Israel. And then he says here, all through here, um, I'll just read a couple of these. Horizon, borrowed from Latin horizon, 
from Horizon, O-R-I-Z-O-N, but they got the diacritical mark there, from Horos boundary. It's the boundary. That's the boundary we have to walk in. It's the boundary of righteousness. Horizon to mark out a bound horizon to a point, decree, specify, declare, determine, limit, ordain. When you don't believe in horizon or predestinate, you don't believe in the boundary of light. Well, I don't think people, you know why they think they say, I don't believe in predestinate because it's confusing to them and they don't want to take the time to learn it. And I've got, now let me say something to you. Most people believe that God has predestined us to be like him in heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. We've got to be like him here on earth. Let me erase all this. I hope you can really see the the, the likeness of Horizo, Apo Rizzo, and Pro Horizo. They're, they're the same word. One means before. The other means to set off. God does the setting off. He says, the boundary that we have to walk by, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Those are our boundaries. And it's really hard for the outer man to learn to do that or not to do that. Now, I've got, let me say something to you. Most people think we're going to be like Christ in heaven. Well, we are, but the boundary is here on earth. The boundary of light is here on earth. There is not going to be a pre-trib rapture. The pre-trib rapture, pre-trib, pre-tribulation, let me write it down like it's supposed to be. No pre-tribulation rapture. There's not going to be a millennium. And this has to do with what I'm talking about. No millennium. See, the, the, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. The, these people that believe in a, that the time is all divided up into, into divisions. Into divisions. They say these are, these are uh, O-I-K-O-N-O-M-I-A. They say these are periods of time that this is dispensation. And this has to do with what I'm talking about. Dispensation is the word oikonomia. It is not periods of time where they say Adam lived in innocence and Noah lived in conscience and Moses lived under the law. That's not true. They had the law back then. They had conscience back then. And they were not innocent. They were guilty when they come to the tree. And then they say there's this dispensation of the dispensation of grace which is and they say that grace has to do with the New Testament church and the Old Testament is not the church not church I don't know why they think that when you look over here in the book of Acts let me show you in the book of Acts in, ver in chapter 7 uh, this is another one of those things that preachers preach that's just not true. Chapter 7. All through this book of Acts, Stephen is standing before the 
before the council of Jerusalem, standing before the Sanhedrin, and he's telling the whole story of Israel. He goes through Abraham and goes through Moses in the wilderness, and he goes through the whole thing. And when he gets up to Moses, he says, he says here in verse, let's read 36 and 37. He brought them out of, out that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet, he said this in Acts 13 and 22. Uh, not Acts, said this over in uh, Deuteronomy. He said this, I believe it's in Deuteronomy 13. A prophet shall the Lord raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear. This is he, talking about Jesus, the prophet that will be raised up. This is he that was in the church, the ecclesia, In the church in the wilderness. When they were in the wilderness, God called them the church. They're called out. They were called out of Egypt. We're called out of this world to live righteously like Christ in his image. Like Christ. And they were called out. How can you have that? being the church, because you cannot have a millennium. It amazes me. I've studied millennium. I've studied... Augustine said, I could believe in the millennium if the men that believe in it... Augustine was one of the great early scholars of the church. He said, I could believe in the millennium if it's spiritual. Well, it is. It is spiritual. Millennium, let me take you back over to Revelation. Back to Revelation, the 20th chapter, Revelation 20. I don't, I've heard my father and all of his friends preach a thousand year reign. I couldn't understand that. There's some questions I had about it. I thought, what's going to happen? We're, here's what they say. This is what these, these dispensationalists believe. Dispensation is oikonomia. It, it is a construction of oikos, which means house, and nomos. Nomos is the Greek word law. It means the law, the law of the house of God. Well, the house is us. Christ is the son of his own house who are, who's, who are, that's us there in Hebrews 3 and 6. So we're the house of God. The house of God was the inner sanctuary. They call that God's house just beyond the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was, because God came down out of the cloud and judged Israel from there. He was, that was the house of God. They call that his house, or the Holy of Holies, or the inner sanctuary. Well, so we're the house of God now because we've got a heart that's got the law written on tables of, written on fleshy tables of the heart. They had a law written on tables of stone kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was sprinkled and our hearts are sprinkled in the New Testament. Hebrews 10, 22. Well, so, okonomia means the law of the house of God. And we dispense that from our mouths. It doesn't have anything to do with periods of time. Well, these people who believe, believe in a in a in a thousand year reign, thousand year reign. I'm going to write it like that. They believe in it. They believe that at the end of the church age. I'm just telling you what these 
dispensationalists believe. They believe the Lord's going to come with a trumpet and he's going to rapture the saints out in a pre-trib rapture. And he's going to rapture the saints out. They'll go out to meet the Lord in the air. Then there's going to be seven years tribulation for the Jews. This is what they believe. And they believe so many Jews will be saved. And then after that will come a thousand years. Now, here's what always puzzled me as a kid. This is what got me. I couldn't figure this out. At the end of this seven-year tribulation, how does Jesus come back? And how does he start the thousand years? And they say people are going to die through the thousand years. They say people are going to die through the seven years. But the Bible says... When Christ comes back, he will destroy all of his enemies. And when he comes back, the last enemy, according to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the last enemy that he destroys is death. How could he come back at a pre-trip rapture and people dying all through that? How could people be dying? They say people who didn't get their new bodies here, they'll have to go into the thousand-year reign, and they'll be dying all through that. That's ridiculous. Because when he comes, the last thing he destroys is death. And when he comes, that's the last trump. And we're going to be changed at the last trump. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. Last is the word eschatos, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S. We get our word eschatology from that, which means the study of the end times. Eschatos, last, means the last in a series after which no other trumpet will sound. No trumpet will sound after the last one. Well, there's things that don't add up with that. Let me show you here in First Thessalonians. I didn't bring this out the other time. I'll I'll come back to the twentieth chapter. Let me just show you in First Thessalonians real quick. First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Fourth chapter, of First Thessalonians. Fourth chapter. And they they say. These dispensations will say, they'll quote 1 Corinthians 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment. In the twink of an eye, at the last trump, and then they add another phrase in there that's not there. They say, at the last trump, the saints shall hear. That, that the saints shall hear is not in the text. It's not in the Bible. We'll be changed at the last trump. Not at the last trump the saints will hear. That's ridiculous to add that to that. That's adding to the word of God, you guys. John McCarthy, you've added that to the word of God. You need to stop that. And then he says here, to show this is the last trump. And they quote this chapter as proof of this secret coming right before the tribulation. There's no secret coming. Never was. And it says here, verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Sleep is a term that's used for the dead elect. When you die, your body goes into a grave, your spirit goes either to the Lord or to hell, one of the two. You can see that in the 16th chapter of Luke where the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes and Lazarus was scared to Abraham's bosom. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain, I believe they read this like this is a secret coming. The problem is we means the church. They're alive and perilipo, P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O, P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O, means to survive. 
the implication is there's some great war against the saints and there will be. Survive. We are alive and, and survive this great onslaught. Shall not we that are alive and remain unto the coming parousia, physical arrival. P-A-R-E-O-U-S-I-A. His physical arrival shall not go before those that are asleep. Prevent means to go before, pathema. Shall not go before those that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now that's ridiculous to say this is a secret coming. Shout is the word kaluma. K-E-L-E-U-M-A. If anybody had ever defined this, they would know this wasn't a silent coming. Kaluma means a war cry. He's coming back to make war with the beast world system. War cry. How can this be a silent coming like they all teach? This is not silent. It's loud and clear. He's coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those that know not God, that obey not the narrow way, the gospel. It's just how they can get that out of this chapter, I don't know. Besides that, there is always seven trumpets. Seven is the number of divine refinement. Let me show you something here. And this last trump goes along with no, with no, no millennium. There can't be a millennium. The word is not millennium. It's what they've translated to the millennium. I believe the translator made a lot of mistakes. I know they did, especially with Easter. They made a mistake in translation over in that, in that, uh, fifth chapter of Matthew and I'm not going to go into that right now but go back over here to Revelation how much time do I have Mike? 29. 29 let's go over here back over here to the 20th chapter of Revelation this has been one of the most confusing things I even when I was a kid I knew there was something wrong I knew that it wasn't right and he says here in verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit. It's not bottomless pit. It's a busos. A-B-U-S-S-O-S. -S it comes from bathos. It means something with great knowledge. And the alpha primitive, the alpha primitive negates the word great knowledge it means it's it's the first letter of the greek alphabet as an alpha primitive it negates knowledge it means no knowledge just like atypical means not typical or asexual means not sexual same thing in the english and he laid his laid hold on the dragon dracon it doesn't mean a fire-breathing dragon. It means a fascinator. That old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Word is not one, zero, zero, zero. The word is not even thousand. The word is kilia. And it is Plural. So with being plural, it has to be two kilia or more. And thousand is equivalent to kilia. But if it's two kilia or more, it's two thousand. And that Satan is bound, dio, forbidden, forbidden from doing something. For a 2,000 year period, he's forbidden. From what? He's forbidden, he's bound, or forbidden from deceiving the nations, 
no more till the 2,000 years is fulfilled. There is a time period he can't deceive the nations. I don't know why they translated nations and they didn't put Gentiles. Because Gentile and nations are the exact same word. Both of them are ethnos. So he could not deceive the Gentiles for a 2,000 year period from Acts 2 till the end of time. That's why I believe we may be really close to the end of time. I don't believe God has done anything that's non-mathematical in the Bible. If a day is of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, then we very well could be coming up to the end of time. In Acts 2, Peter said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, if Peter said at Pentecost that this would happen in the last days when God poured out his Spirit on all flesh, Spirit is truth, and the people that were forbidden before that were the Gentiles for 4,000 years. They could not have the truth other than a certain few, 4,000 years. Then if this is that, and the la then the last days are here in Acts 2. Very well could be that we're headed right to the end. There's so much lethargy among the Christians. So much, I don't care. The Christians are saying, I don't care about those figures, Jim Brown. I don't care about those great words. Well, you're going to have a tough time telling God that at the judgment. I believe we're real close to the end. Look at the government. The government is crazy. It's nuts. All preachers and all politicians are lying. All of them. They won't go to the truth of the Word of God. I have found so many mistakes in the King James Bible. The King James is not the inspired Word of God. The Textus Receptus is. That's a Latin term, meaning received text. And here's the Greek text of the Bible in an interlinear Bible. This is it right here. It's not the King James Bible. And a lot of times when you check this book with a King James Bible, I use a King James because it comes from the correct text. That's why I use it. But do I believe that every word in this is exact? No, I don't believe that. Because I've found some of the mistakes myself. It's just like when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Every time he said that I am the way, you can't even translate that because every time it's either hey, taste, or tay, or tame. Feminine, gender, singular. How are you going to translate I am taste way? The feminine way. You can't put... You can't say, I am the, and then put in parentheses, feminine. You can't do that. You're adding to the Word of God. There's no way to translate the Greek text into the English Bible correctly. Not exactly correctly, because you can't put the genders in there. Can you? You can't. I have studied the Bible enough to see a lot of the errors of some of the translators. I use the King James. I believe it is overall the Word of God. But boy, you get into genders and tenses and it's just not right a lot of times. I could show you other things. I'm not going to do that now. So it says, he could not deceive the Gentiles till the 2,000 years should be fulfilled and after that, it doesn't say after that. It says meta. After is not a good word. Meta. With this deception for 2,000 years, with it, that means with. It doesn't mean after. With that, he must be loosed a little season with the end coming at the end of the 2,000 years. He's got to be loosed. 
Do I believe Satan is loose right now? Absolutely. Preachers are lying. Politicians are lying. Everybody's lying everywhere, aren't they? Jim Brown, do you think you're the only one telling the truth? Let me tell you what. I'm, let me tell you like I tell anybody that says that. You think you're the only one telling the truth. If I am telling the truth, you better listen or you're in trouble with God. You better check me out. I've had people say, I'm going to check you out. I say, please do. I'm not a stupid man. I look at everything from a mathematical perspective. Everything must add up. And that's something preachers don't believe. I was a top math student in school. I mean, I had A's in every math course I had. Because I, I loved the mathematics. When I got into preaching, I started using those mathematical rules in preaching. Things equal to the same thing or equal to each other. If equals are substitute for equal, the results are equal. And I have learned to do that. And when you really analyze scripture it's not the way the preachers are saying there's no pentecostal tongues that's idiocy there's no faith healing if there's faith healing why did the most famous faith healer in the world in the last hundred years old roberts die of pneumonia in his own hospital why didn't benny hen come and heal him that's stupid isn't it besides that all the rest of them are dying all of them are dying. The guy that started TBN, Paul Crouch, he died of congestive heart failure. He had wrestled with that for 10 years, they'll tell you, on the Internet. If he's, by the time he's wrestling with congestive heart failure for two years, at that point, why don't we call Benny Hinn and say, you've got to come and heal me because I've got this congestive heart failure. The doctor uh, diagnosed that. Uh, can you heal me? Just stupid. And it goes on in down here. Let me just show you something else about last Trump. There's, there were seven trumpets. Seven trumpets always denotes finality. Seven. And the Bible doesn't say we're going to be changed at the last trump the saints will hear. That is a, John McCarthy, if you're telling people that, you're lying to them. It doesn't say that. It says last trump. The seventh trump is the last trump in the Bible. Not only that, but the Jews had seven trumpet festivals. And the amazing thing, the festival started in the month of Nisan. Nisan is the month March, April. March, April. That's what is March, April? Isn't that the beginning of the crop being reaped? Isn't that when the isn't that when the when the vegetables start blooming and coming out and the wheat comes out and the corn comes out. And for seven straight months, that's from March, April to Tishri. Notice what you can tie with this. Tishri is September, October. Oh, wait a minute. September, October. The end of the harvest is October the thirty first. This is the this is the season of shall I say it? Light. That's when the sun is at its strongest is in the crop season. Wasn't God's promise of Deuteronomy twenty eight? I will multiply your crops, you'll go out and all your crops will be rich and your your basket will be full and your fields will be full and you'll be you'll do real great if you keep my commandments and my statutes that was the condition it was conditional did Israel do that no they didn't do it this is the light part of the year 
all the rest of the year is where the pagans will worship their gods. They worship, they'd start worshiping their gods in October or Halloween, All Hallows Eve. And then they would worship their gods on down here to get to the winter solstice. Winter solstice, December the 21st. And they would worship their gods there. And they had the feast of Saturn. Where they're thanking their gods for their crops. And that's where they, in this feast of Saturn, that's where Constantine brought that feast of Saturn in the church and renamed it Christmas, Christ Mass. Did that in 325 A.D. at the Nicene Council. And then they go on up here. They have Valentine's, which is a part of, which is a part of the same system. I got all kinds of notes on that. I don't have time to go into it. Valentine's. And then at that time of the year, they also had, they had Mardi Gras which is the same thing as Christmas, Mardi Gras. And then right after that, they had Ishtar, what they've renamed Easter. And these are all the gods of darkness because the bright part of the year has to be in March, April, and all of their Easter came at the end of March. So they had their Easter gods. I'll talk about that Sunday. They had their Mardi Gras, which is the same thing as the Feast of Saturn. And they had their All Hallows Eve. And they have other names on the, on the board. And so this is the time of the year. It's this period of light. It's the period of crops. And so they had a festival for seven straight months. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they would call these festivals, they would call these a new moon festival. The festival of the new moon was the first of every month, and they were celebrating their crops God giving it to them when they were obedient to him. So for seven straight months until the end of the harvest. And the end of the harvest was where they would separate the sheep from the goats. That's what Jesus is going to do at the last judgment. And they would separate the wheat from the tares at that at the end of that. They left the wheat and the tares grow together. That's what Jesus said. And then they would separate the wheat from the from the tares. And the tares were the weeds. And they would throw the tares into the fire. That's a picture of hell. Of the fire. And that when that last trumpet sound, that's when the sheep are separated from the goats. That is a picture of the end of time that was in their festivals. How can people not want this or not see this? And they had one other seven trumpets. When you go to Joshua, the sixth chapter. Do I have any time, Mike? Thirteen. Go to Joshua. Let's go over to Joshua, the sixth chapter. Here's another set of trumpets. We're going to be changed at the last trump. That's when God's going to destroy his enemies just like he did in Joshua. He destroyed his enemies at the signing of the seventh trump. And he redeemed the crops and redeemed the sheep. Sixth chapter. And they have to march around Jericho. They come to Jericho. Jericho is one of the first towns. If you'll notice, this is in Joshua. Joshua was, it was appointed to go in and be the leader of Israel because Moses was forbidden to come in to the land. God took him up on the mountain and, 
said, you can look at the land, but you can't go in. Joshua was the leader, and he leads the people. In verse 4, seven priests will bear the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horns, and seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat at the signing of the last trump. And the people that ascend up, every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said, Take up the ark of the covenant and, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets. Isn't this amazing? It's the same seven as here and the same seven that's over in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. Isn't that amazing? And seven is the word Sheba in the Hebrew. Sheba. The queen of Sheba was the queen of seven. And it comes from Shaba, S-H-A-B-A. Shaba means to, it, it means to mature or to seven oneself. There's seven things we have, have to add to our faith there in Second Peter 1 and 5. And if we add these seven to our faith, we will not fall, and we can make our calling and election sure. With bibios means to stabilize our election by adding these seven things. And here's the seven trumpets. Let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And he said unto the people, Pass on, encompass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets, and the ark of the comfort of the Lord followed them. And the armed men were before the priest and blew with trumpets. And the re-reward, which means to bring up the rear, came after the ark that the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you to shout at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Remember, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. And here he's telling the people, I'll tell you when to shout. And that's when the walls will come down. And that's when Christ will come back at the signing of the last or the seventh trumpet. See that? That's not even hard to see, is it? Then shall you shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city going about once and came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of why do you think it's seven? Because you've got seven all the way through the Bible. Seven trumpets for those new moon festivals. Seven trumpets, Revelation 8, 9, and 10. Before the ark of the Lord went on continuing and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the re reward of the rear came after the ark of the Lord. And the priests going on, blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned to the camp as they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day. Seven is very significant. All through Revelation, you got seven trumpets, seven vows, seven, seven all the way through dozens of times. Encompassed the city after the same manner, seven times only on the day that they compassed only city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpet, Joshua said unto the people, Shout! Like Jesus is going to shout at the end. A war cry. This is a war cry. And the Lord had given you the city. And, they, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord only Rahab the harlot, a Gentile, she was one of the few exceptions, shall live, she and all that are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye 
and any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But it goes on through here. Look at verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city and every man straight before him and they took the city and they utterly destroyed all of Jericho, all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old and ox and sheep and ass and with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath and that she swear. They swear unto her. They told her and she dropped that red dropped that red thread out of her window, that picture of the blood of Christ. And they, they knew not to touch her house. That's do I have any time, Mike? Six. I've got so many things to say on this. This, the way people have done the the last Trump and the millennium, it's just disgusting that they don't look at all of the trumpets. If we're going to be changed at the last Trump, there's one other verse here in Matthew 24. This is the last Trump. Matthew 24. This has to be the last trump by the context. Matthew 24. The apostles asked Jesus what's going to be the sign of that coming and at the end of the world. And he tells them all these signs. And then he says in verse 29. This is after Christ uh, comes. For as in verse 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming, the parousia, the physical arrival of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation, that is the time factor, after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be dark and the moon will not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and then shall the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angel after the tribulation. He shall send his angels to the great sound of a last trump. This is after the tribulation. That's the verse 29 says. These things will happen after the tribulation. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, just like they separate the wheat from the tares, just like they separate the sheep from the goats at those seven trumpets of, of new moons. And he's elect from the four winds and one end of heaven to the other. And he goes on and talks about the end of time there. I hope you can see that <clears throat> there is no pre-trib rapture. There is no millennium. The thousand years is right now, except it's not a thousand. I keep saying, I've got a book called The History of a Zero. And they tell you that there were no zeros in first century Greek. And thousand is a noun, just like dozen is a noun. Thousand is not an adjective, not 999. Adjectives tell which, what, kind of, how many. But thousand is a form of one. Multiples of 10, 100, and 1,000 are a form of the original number. So in order to have plural, kilia, it has to be 2,000 or more. I've studied this for years. That'll be all. I'll come back and... We'll talk about Easter on Sunday because it's Easter Sunday and that is, shows you just how corrupt the church is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help me to say the truth so people can understand it. There's so much to this. Lord, I'm so tired of what's going on in the world. I'm tired of the preachers. I'm tired of the politics. I'm tired of everything. 
I'm getting to where that I'm even tired of the trees and the ground and the grass and the no, everything is a facade. It all looks good, but it's going to end very soon. Fight our battles. I can't fight anymore. I, I love you, Lord. I'm going to preach your word till I die. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I don't believe in no millennium. Everybody wants to explain away everything with what some scholar said. Everybody's walking around blind. It's like we're we're in a world full of zombies. That that TV show about the dead, the Walking Dead. <laughs> we're living in that. You know what they need to do? They need to rename that TV show Walking Dead. They call it The Walking Baptists. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's what they need to do. Because they're dead. Couldn't call it The Walking Catholics. But that wouldn't fool anybody. Walking Baptists. <laughs>